Greetings everybody around the world. It's time once again for Ancient Aliens Radio. This is the dedicated radio show for the cast of Ancient Aliens. Here we interview authors and researchers as an ongoing investigation into the ancient alien theory. Don't forget to like us on Facebook or subscribe to the YouTube channel Ancient Aliens Radio. This is your host James and I am delighted to be doing a megalithic show today. I've got my three friends on the call. I have Mr. Brian Forster, I have Hugh Newman and I have Andrew Collins, all titans in the field of megalithic research and others as well. And uh, we're going to get the latest updates from the guys. Uh, so let me just bring the guys in one at a time, I guess. Hi, Brian. You're very welcome to the show. Thank you very much, James. Oh, great to hear you back again, Brian. And um, we have Hugh Newman on the call as well. Hugh, can you give me your voice read, please? Uh, I'm here for you, James. Oh, great to hear you, brother. Uh, we will be seeing each other in Megalithomania. We're going to get into that as well a little bit on the show. Can't wait to see you soon for a TV interview as well, Hugh. I'm going to nail you down for a TV interview. Okay, uh, sounds good. Yeah. And uh, we have Andrew Collins on back on the show as well. Andrew, where are you there? Yes, I'm fine. Yes, I'm happy to be back. Uh, lots of things happening, so uh, raring to go. Oh, excellent. Well, we'll keep the rotation for the audience and... Uh, you know, wow, Brian, what's new with you? I, 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 where do I go? Do I, I, we got DNA analysis to talk about, Lebanon, Baalbek. Um, let's jump straight into some uh, megalithic stuff first, I guess, Brian. Uh, how, how did you get on in Lebanon? Tell me about Baalbek, a place I've always, always longed to go. Um, well, we had actually quite a trip. It was um, from Lima to Mexico, where we spent six days uh, looking at Toltec and Aztec sites then to the U.S., then to Egypt, where we spent uh, two and a half weeks, and then four days in Lebanon, the main focus being Baalbek, which is completely mind-blowing, I have to tell you. Um, just on the, on the trip from Beirut uh, and traveling through the, <clears throat> the valley to get to Baalbek, um, we were all very in deep anticipation, and the first thing we saw was the quarry, with two massive thousand ton plus stones lying there for us to observe. So we had a full day there and it was, uh, we're going back every year, every April. Oh, wow. Um, what's your feeling there, Brian? Are these perhaps the biggest known megaliths we got at the moment? Well, to put it in a nutshell, it seems that whoever was doing this initial construction, they were working with enormous blocks, some 400 tons, some 800 tons, some 1200 tons. And with the two that are still in the quarry, I think what it tells us is that whoever was doing the initial work suddenly stopped work, and uh, the site was left for probably thousands of years until the Romans decided to build things on top of it. Um, but it is very, very mysterious, and I urge anyone who has the opportunity to go and visit Baalbek. It's very safe there. There's no... Mm -hmm. You know, terrorism or anything like that. Uh, Lebanon is a very wealthy country, um, and uh, we had a fabulous time. Oh wow! Yeah, that was my only concern. Uh, people always think about, uh, you know, Lebanon's a troublesome spot, but uh, it, it's it's quite peaceful, you reckon, Brian? Oh, definitely. We were twenty miles from the Syrian border, and um, you know, massive agriculture, large wealthy farmhouses. Um, everyone was just doing their daily activity. Um, very little security was necessary. Um, so a lot of what people see, you know, on, on mainstream television is garbage. Um, it's possible southern Lebanon is problematic, but that, that part of Lebanon is very placid and has Baalbek. Oh, wow. You know, Brian, uh, like you mentioned, the Romans there... Uh... A lot of the archaeologists, they, they focus, oh, the Romans built this temple and these, these, these massive, massive, enormous megaliths. But, uh, like you say, the, the Romans came in later and, uh, just, it's like many ancient sites, Brian, they just adopted what was there. Well, definitely. And even our tour guide, who was Lebanese, said that, um, the reason why the Romans decided to build with, you know, 400, 800, and, or, and 1200 ton stones is they wanted to show the local people their amazing prowess at architecture. And as soon as I heard that, I just broke out laughing. Somebody obviously made that story up because they don't understand the fact that uh, someone was there much farther back in time and had the capability of uh, cutting out these huge blocks and moving them more than a, a mile and pushing them together with incredible accuracy. Yeah. Wow. 
Wow. Um, tell me about this big giant obelisk, Brian, this monster. I mean, what, what's your feeling on that? Was that like the obelisks of, of, of Egypt? Uh, well, there are two giant stones still in the quarry, um, and there, you know, you have to spend almost as much time in the quarry as you do at the site of Baalbek itself, because it tells you the story. One of them, uh, again, about a thousand tons, was cut from the side of the limestone bedrock outcrop and tumbled down and is in its original position. It's, you know, it, it was later quarried by the Romans because you can see pieces that were removed, but the main one that some people call the the pregnant pregnant mother, or something like mm -hmm. some odd name, it's still attached to the bedrock, and so you can see that um, you know a lot of work was done on it, but sudden it seems suddenly the site was abandoned because there's a, a massive crack on one side that I think the ancient um, carvers or Builders were, were following in order to release the stone mm -hmm. from the bedrock, but they never managed to, um, to actually remove it. And there has been recent excavation around that stone itself. So it allows you to see where some of the other giant stones, uh, the impressions of where they were removed from. Wow. Must be great to see the stuff in situ in the quarry, Brian. Oh, it is. I mean, it's a real, it's a real detective story. Um, we, we saw evidence of, I think, machine marks mm -hmm. involved in, wow. in uh, attempting to cut away the 1,200 stone block from its uh, bedrock base. Um, and again, this mysterious crack that's in the front and follows all the way down one side, but is not on the other side. I'm not sure if that was <clears throat> something done by those trying to extract the stone or, or whether that was a natural crack that they were actually trying to work with in order to, at some point, remove this, um, you know, this giant block that is remaining in situ. I think that's the point to, to, to worth noting there, Brian. The bigger a piece of stone you're trying to carve out of the ground, the more chance you're running into hitting a natural crack. Yeah, and actually the the thing is that that stone, as you can see in any photograph, it's at an angle. It's not, you know, perfectly horizontal. So the top surface matches where this crack is underneath. Wow. Um, very well. And you can see where, where they were doing the undercut, right where the crack is, in order to try to liberate the stone, but they never managed to finish the job. It's incredible. Um, do you see any comparisons between there and the unfinished obelisk in Egypt, in Aswan? Actually, the, the technology used at, um, at Aswan is different. Um, but another fascinating thing about Baalbek is that we had two geologists with us who had spent um, hours and hours at the Aswan Quarry with us, and they were able to identify at least a hundred pillars, if not more, of granite, which are in terrible shape in Baalbek, but they identified that stone as having come from Aswan, which is a thousand miles away. So, um, mm. I, and I'm being conservative at saying a hundred granite pillars. There may be two hundred. Wow. Wow. That's incredible, Brian. Brian, do we, do we attribute these to uh, the Canaanites then, the, these, these megalithic structures in Lebanon? Is, is it safe to probably guess that? I would, I would think so. Actually, Andrew knows much more about the Canaanites and the, the so-called uh, Nephilim than I do. Mm -hmm. But um, Mount Hermon, which is supposedly where their Nephilim descended and you know showed their presence on Earth, uh, we saw as we were driving in the bus. Oh, beautiful. It's actually in, in the neighborhood, and the gargantuan effort involved in doing this work um, is not something that um, the Romans could have possibly done i don't think so it's it's one of those sites like egypt where you find megalithic work peru and bolivia where you find megalithic work attributed to um you know very specific well-known cultures but indeed there's a lot of evidence that um a lot of this work in all of those countries was done thousands of years prior by mysterious people that we're trying to figure out. Mm, sure. Wow, Brian, so interesting. Uh, let me move on, Brian. I'm going to come back to you and catch up on some uh, DNA results as well. Um, you know, I love what you do, Brian. It's just, uh, it's, it's fascinating because I know you've got this, I know you've got this discerning eye from, from the, from the knowledge of all the places you've been and, and, uh, great to hear this feedback, Brian. Um, you know, I haven't heard it spoke about like that before in Lebanon. Um, um, Hugh got Hugh on the call next. Uh, Hugh, tell me about, uh, your travels.
Because I believe you've been to Gunang Padang. Uh, tell me what's happening with Gunang Padang. Tell me your feelings there, you. Oh, my God. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Gunang Padang. Uh, Andrew and I went there uh, after our we did a tour to Angkor Wat and then uh, continued uh, down to Java. Um, and the Gunung Padang is a very strange place. I mean, uh, we, we call it now, you know, um, Java's Machu Picchu because mm. it's this hilltop site with these tens of thousands of blocks, it, it seems, these andesite um, polygonal kind of columns that almost look like they're kind of uh, shaped like crystals um, all over the site. And we, we were there with Danny Hillman. And you can see this, you know, the different levels going all the way down. We went right down the side of it. And he, some of his dating, I mean, Andrew will talk about this as well, but some of the dating there is quite remarkable, going beyond 8,000 BC. But even the suggestions, he even got some parts of the dating, which needs more analysis done, going back 20,000 years mm. or so. So there's, there's quite a lot going on there. And um, it's an absolutely fascinating place. It's, like, it's just like it shouldn't be there. It's just like, wh where is the culture? Where did this come from? Uh, we had a bit of an exciting journey a couple of days after. We went to try and find some other uh, monoliths nearby um, called the Gunstone or the Gun Rock, uh, which uh, actually Andrew uh, will talk about um, his experience with that as well, I'm sure. But I think the Gun and Padang is certainly, um, it should be on people's wish list, just like Baalbek. Um, it's, it's, it's a stunning place. Tell me about the stones they had there, Hugh. They're, they some like they're, what are they? Basalt columns. They're like basalt basalt rocks. Well, they're, and, they're actually andesite, uh, which is the same as you find at Tiwanaku and Pumapunku. Andesite. Uh, so you actually get the same kind of crystalline rock. Wow. Uh, it forms naturally into columns like that. But they've obviously been moved and placed and piled up in in a certain way. Um, I mean, they're not huge. Some of the some of the ones on the lower levels that. Around, um, I think the western side were, were quite large, uh, that were at the, at the lower levels. Um, but it's the same type of rock you, you get at Tiwanaku and, and Pumapunku. Obviously, you find this in different areas around the world. Um, and so, and there's also ac acoustic. Some of the stones have been smoothed, so you have acoustic effects, really? uh, which is another aspect of the site. Um, and, but it's, it's, it's really, really fascinating, really unusual place, but there's a lot more to be done there. Mm -hmm. uh, we filmed a whole load there, so we've got a few video. We've got one video we put up online on, on the Megalithomania YouTube channel, mm -hmm. and we've got other ones we're going to do as well. Um, but there's, there's such a it's a pretty vast site, um, and and there's a whole kind of culture going back very very long time ago around the whole area. Um, this obsidian culture, which is what uh, Andrew's been researching uh, and writing about uh, recently. Wow, fascinating, you, um, you. What's your feeling? Why has this place only come to the forefront of research now? Why is this stuff? Why has it been hiding? I think it's been known about for quite a while. Well, it's a bit like quite a few other sites, really. It's just recognizing it because it was known about since the early 1900s, 1914, mm -hmm. I think it was first reported, but no one had any idea of the age of it and because you do find sites you know kind of similar to that in different you know that part of the world not quite as ex to the extent of good and Padang. um it really didn't come to the forefront until danny hillman who's a geologist who li lives in ba near bandung the, the nearby um the main town there that he when his dating uh, came out it really kind of opened the door for that place and now it's been endorsed by the government there's an official visitor center which buy tickets that they relay in the road and all this kind of stuff which is great because it's, it's preserving the site uh it's giving it the energy it needs um but it's like you know sites b being discovered all around the world i mean look at gebekli tepe for instance i mean mm -hmm. that, that was only discovered a relatively short time ago mm. and uh, i mean it was known about because some stones were found on top for a very long time people thought it was some uh, relatively you know not very old byzantine cemetery so there's there's a lot of um there's a lot more under the ground and a lot more more sites yet to be recognised for what they truly are. Mm. Um, and I think this is the the era where a lot of the, these revelations are going to come out. The reports on the dates, though, Hugh, it's like it's it's like an it's like another Gebekli Tepe, another kind of paradigm buster where it's like this massive date. And some say twenty thousand, some say sixteen thousand. I know the research yeah. still has to be done, but that that time frame is now pushing stuff so far back. It's like well, well, well the, the good thing is that is that there's a geology, a really professional, really thorough geologist working on that, uh, Danny Hillman, who's really kind of you know going to push the science to be done properly there and he's got he's got a lot more research to do 
uh, that's for sure. Uh, before we conclude, you know exactly, you know the, the eras it was being used in. Mm -hmm. But it's like you know, uh, as we know about Beckley Tepe. I mean, that, that's like a, a paradigm shifter. It's, it's really changed everything. And that was carbon dated by German archaeologists. So they, they can't be any messing about with that one. Mm. Uh, and so, I mean, the, the thing with Gunung Badang, you don't get the fine uh, stone relief carvings that you find at Gebekli Tepe or in Egypt or Peru, that kind of thing. It's very like, um, it's almost like the stones, it's been built, there's no evidence of culture there, you can't find any carvings. You can find these cut marks, which is, which is something that fascinated me and Andrew, which we didn't even know about. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen any photos or film of this before we went there. These sort of cut marks, which you find, it's a very British and Scottish tradition at the megalithic sites, and Irish as well, which you probably know about yourself. Sure. Uh, and these cut marks all over, you know, hundreds of these stones. Um, but I've seen these cut marks, and I've, I've, and I've talked about them, I've, wrote, I've written about them over the years at, you find them at Gebekli Tepe, on top of the pillars, in the bedrock, various other places. Mm. You even find examples at Tiwanaku in the Olmec world, even on Easter Island. And so it seems like either it's some kind of very strange natural thing, which is unlikely, or it's, it's part of the tradition, part of the megalith builders' kind of uh, signatures they leave at the site. Incredible. Um, some reports saying that it's, uh, well, actually, just on, on, the, on the columns and the construction and the layout, it's kind of, it reminds me of uh, the place in French Polynesia, um, Nan Madol, the way there's like evidence of these structures of layout and all these, maybe not on the same scale, but um, it seems to be like there's evidence of structure, but obviously lacking in art. Um, any similar yeah. I've heard these comparisons. I've not been a Nama doll yet, but I've seen a lot of film footage and photos. I know David Childress and mm -hmm. Graham Hancock and others have been there. We are, and I am, pla I am planning, and hopefully Andrew as well, to go there um, when we're in Southeast Asia next year because you can get there are flights that go there. Um, but I want to have a look at that for myself and, and make the comparisons because the thing about Nama doll, it seems that like the stones kind of crisscross. Uh, you have one going in one direction and another layer going in the other direction. So it gives it like stability, and mm -hmm. that was that was built into the into the sea. In, mm -hmm. You know, it's almost like uh, they they built part of an island. Yeah, in this huge construction. Uh, but that, but no one has any clue who really did that. I mean, that's been attributed to giants uh, and things like this. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, the comparisons have been made, but there are a few little anomalies you find at Gunung Padang which do match other sites. You get these cut marks. You have the, some of the building techniques. You have the, it's almost like a hilltop, mountaintop um, mm. temple. And also, it's got several magnetic anomalies up on the site, which have been recorded by Danny Hillman. He's a geologist, so that's what he specializes in. Yeah. And he's found these positive and ne negative magnetic anomalies right where these particular parts of the sites were said to be like the throne and the crown and all these other things. Um, and so that intrigues me because that's something that's being recorded all over the world at megalithic sites as though they were deliberately building where these anomalies were to go into altered states or to even charge their seeds up. Um, and so, and also there's a fault line going across about half a mile away along the front edge of like the mountain hill. So, um, and that can, a lot of sites are often built, uh, with, with that nearby or in mind as well. Incredible. You, if you're going to French Polynesia, if you're going to Namadon, you and, and Andrew, I'm coming. Put me on the plane with you guys. I don't care what it costs. I'm going there because I'm going on a Capricorn TV field trip for sure. It's my lifelong okay. dream to go there. Sounds like a plan. Expedition. Oh, definitely. Yeah. You let me know about the details of that. Uh, Hugh, do you think this is a pyramid? Do, do I think it's a pyramid? Yeah, does, it's like a man-made hill stroke pyramid. People are t giving reports that it's it's badly weathered, but it's uh, it was built um, on a man-made well, hill. Not, it's not. Uh, I mean, it's built upon uh, the top of a natural hill, uh, I think, um, and it's been then you know there's been something put on the top of it as such. So mm. I don't think it's a pyramid from the base upwards, uh, like you find in Egypt or, or other places, but. Um, it's it's just one of the the most intriguing places I've I've ever been to, and it's got this real magical kind of quality about it. Just the environment, the jungle environment. Uh, it's even got a sacred spring, a natural spring at the base of it, which was actually built around. So they were like, it was it was a used site. It was for many thousands of years, but it's not technically. I don't think it's a pyramid. I mean, Andrew might correct me or have other opinions about that, but uh, I don't know if it's a pyramid. It's more of a hilltop structure, much like. 
Machu Picchu is a hilltop structure. Mm. Um, that's not class of the pyramid, but so there's it's, an, it's such an unusual site. I think it's got its own kind of um, genre as such. Sure. Sure. Um, Andrew, wow, great responses there. Uh, Andrew, anything on yeah. uh, the Canaanites in the Nephilim and uh, <coughs> the or- origins of Baalbek? Um, well, the, I've got a couple of articles on uh, anthropologies.com all about the pre Roman um, evidence of activity at Baalbek. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I mean, there is, there is a lot of activity there, um, probably going back at least to uh, about 2500 BC. I mean, there's nothing really that goes back any further as far as our absolute knowledge of the site. Um, but of course, you have these legends, um, and a lot of them suggest that it's got something to do with, um, you know, Cain or, the, you know, the, the, one of the, you know, the, the sons of Adam building it, um, and that he was the origin of these people known as the Kenites, um, and that, um, you know, they were giants and, you know, they invented the first, um, smithy and the first metalwork and the rest of it but i mean how much these legends really actually relate to what's going on about back i don't know and although you have these incredibly large blocks which as brian says must be incredibly impressive um before jumping to too many conclusions to conclusions there is one possibility and i mean brian will you know perhaps uh, answer this and that's the fact that there are um, pillars actually within the Roman temple there of Zeus, which are many hundreds of tons in their own right. Um, and to create those, you would have to have, have, have chiseled out blocks, you know, many hundreds of tons even more than those actual pillars, you know, just like obviously um, uh, Gebekli Tepe. Um, there's 50 ton um, unfinished stones in quarries there, but by the time that they would actually reach the site and be erected, they would probably only weigh about 15 to 20 tons. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you have to have that amount amount of excess around them so that they can be chipped um, and carved properly into shape. So that's the only get-out clause at the moment. Um, but Brian might have something to say about that a little later on. But um, if I can pick up the the, the Ganun Padang uh, um, oh, gauntlet please, yeah. uh, for, please. for the moment, I mean, obviously, I second everything that Hugh said. I mean, it, it is an extraordinary sight. I mean, you know, and I mean, basically, what you've got is a natural volcanic plug. I think that's what it is originally. Sure. Uh, somewhere inside of which is a lava tube. So, in other words, like a vertical um, chamber. Um, and this seems to have been the focus of building activity on the site. And it would seem that um, a tiered structure was built around this volcanic plug using the andesite um, columnar blocks, which were probably actually um, obtained from the site itself and then reused and repositioned to create the monument itself. And these were built originally in tiers to create this pyramid shape actually on the hill itself and this would seem to have been done as much as between 8 and 13,000 years ago with evidence of activity going back even further probably in association with this 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 cave like you know lava tube um, and in other words that would seem to have been the main focus of activity and what they may have been doing is capping some kind of supernatural power that would seem to be associated with this cave-like structure. Um, and the reason why they would be doing this is that directly in front of Gnumpa Dang is a mountain, which is in fact a volcano, known as Gnumpa Gede. Um, and this is a volcano, a very active volcano. Um, and it's quite clear that Gnumpa Dang in its current state, and even within the lower layers themselves, they all have the same orientation directly towards this volcano, um, as if this volcano represents some kind of personification of a god, maybe a fire god or, a, or some kind of creator god or something like that, and that everything seems to be focused around the idea of control of the natural elements, the natural elements specifically around fire 
which would represent um, you know the, the 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 status quo of the world. In other words, what they were doing there were rituals and activities that would keep the balance and harmony in the world, um, so that there was no longer um, volcano eruptions, cataclysms, and things like that. And I would say that something similar was actually going on at uh, Gobekli Tepe. You know what I've, I've said and written about there is that one of the main functions of Gobekli Tepe was to try and keep the status quo of the universe, to try and stop supernatural forces coming into the physical world, like comets and asteroids and things like this, to try and keep them at bay, or the supernatural forces seen as responsible for these cataclysms. And rituals, you know, shamanic practices, all the rest of it would be done mm -hmm. to keep this status quo. And I, so, in other words, I think that there's a very similar purpose behind both Gobekli Tepe and Gunung Padang. Even though they are on opposite sides of the world, they were constructed probably around the same time, at least, say, ten to 12,000 years ago in both cases. And in Gunung Padang's case, possibly even earlier than that by thousands of years. So there is a commonality here. But the bigger question is, if there is a commonality, does it involve some kind of lost civilization? And that's really what we need to establish. Mm. Um, we need to establish whether there is some kind of mother civilization behind this. Some people might call it Atlantis, Lemuria, or Mu, or whether you get flowerings of civilization at different in different parts of the world that open like flowers for a few thousand years and then close due to cataclysm, you know, floods, disease, famine, things like this. And another flower, if you like, opens else somewhere else in the world and that also then continues for a few thousand years before closing itself. In other words, whether this is a cyclic thing or whether there is a single great lost civilization out there somewhere that's responsible for all of the engineering technology and know-how and the beliefs and practices behind such, you know, powerful places as Gobekli Tepe and Gunung Padang. Incredible. Yeah, you know, I think the more progress that's made and the and discoveries are coming in faster, uh, and we'll talk about the Bolivian Pyramid as well, um, but uh, the, more this, the more that comes up and the more that's researched, uh, I, I'm definitely convinced of an ancient global maritime civilization. I think there's too many commonalities, uh, Andrew, without a doubt. Too many commonalities. Wow, well, Andrew, is there any, uh, ch any uh, evidence of alignments or magnetic anomalies there at Gunang Badang? Um, I mean, uh, we went around the site with um, Danny Hillman, who's the geologist that's doing all the good work there. I mean, you know, w without him, the greater antiquity of Gunung Padang, you know, would, would be unknown. So we must thank him for all the work he's been doing there over the past five years. Um, I mean, Hugh actually went round um, the site and looked at every magnetic anomaly with Danny, filming Danny um, and, you know, having conversations about um, each different spot and testing it out with any equipment that, w that we had with us. And there are a number, and Hugh might want to talk about that, um, shortly. Um, but as far as alignments are concerned, uh, the main alignment, as I said, is the main axial, axial alignment of Gunung Padang is north, northwest towards the, um, the peak of this volcano called Gede. Um, however, beyond that, in a time frame of probably around eight to nine thousand BC, when it would almost certainly have been in use, um, the bright, the bright star, the bright star Vega, um, in the constellation of, uh, Lyra, um, would have been seen to set directly down into Gede. Now, the importance about, um, a Vega is that it had formerly been a pole star, uh, between about, uh, 13 and 11,000 BC. Um, and it is recognized um, throughout the um, Eastern Asia and Southeast Asia, even into uh, Indonesia, as representing um, this goddess who is known as the Weaver Princess. 
who is seen to uh, have forged the stars, forged the heavens, um, and created the Milky Way. Um, and she, there's, there's various stories about her losing the loom of her weaving, um, you know, weaving equipment. And somehow this seems to be some kind of memory of the star Vega shifting away from the position of pole star. And even though Ganun Padang is actually south of the equator by about uh, six or seven degrees, mm-hmm. um, Java was once part of a much larger landmass, uh, which is generally known today as Sundaland. Uh, and this embraced a, a number of the Indonesian islands, including uh, Borneo to the north. Um, and so, this actually straddles the equator. So if you went to the north of the equator by just one degree within Sunderland, you know, you would see this incredibly bright star hanging over the horizon around which all of the stars would turn um, at night. And that must have been an incredible sight. And you can understand why Vega may have become important and why at the time when uh, Ganun Padang was up and running, let's say between eight and 9,000 BC, that this would have absolutely um, emphasised the significance of this star and this tradition to do with this, this goddess, this deity known as the Weaver Princess, who would seem to be not just some kind of supernatural, um, you know, pers- 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 you know, personage, but also it seems to be connected with sovereignty, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, and the embodiment within uh, the queen stroke princess um, and that somehow their lives were somehow bound up with the, you know, the sovereignty of the land um, in a way that, that ref- is reflected in the heavens. And it's quite weird because at um, Ganun Padang, uh, each of the different monuments you've got there, the different stone settings, the different rock piles, have all got their own name in Javanese. Um, and, you know, I actually asked a local guardian and guide to, to talk me through the whole spiritual map of Ganun Padang and how it relates to this this mountain called Ganun uh, Gede, um, how it relates to, to the whole landscape. And this is a marvellous, incredible um, journey, which I shall, you know, be publishing at some point. And what's important is that right at the top, on the top terrace, there is um, a, a, a beautiful spot with with this stone floor and the stone setting around it, known as the throne. And the the throne, it, it said, is where the king would stand, you know, and and watch this 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 um, volcano. And next to him would stand, you know, the queen. And uh, you know, and th- it was a site that that Hugh and I realised was was the most spiritual. Sp- place there and we, we went there to do meditations and things like this and it's unquestionable that there is some right of sovereignty associated with Ganun Padang something like almost like marrying you know the 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 queen or the or the princess to the land in, in a way which we know from Arthurian tradition in you know in western mysteries you know within Britain the idea that the king and the land are one you know and that as one prospers so will the other well, it seems as if something similar was going on in Java um, in connection with Ganun Padang. And that it was believed, I think, that as long as, you know, the, the, the reigning sovereigns mm-hmm. were in good health, this volcano would not erupt. But if things started going bad within the royal family, then eruptions could take place, could, cataclysms could occur. Um, so there's, there's, there's a lot there. You know, we're beginning to flesh out what exactly Ganun Padang means. Um, and on top of this, we're looking at discovering the material culture behind Ganun Padang. Because you walk around there and you do not find stone tools. Whereas if you're at Gobekli Tepe, you find literally thousands of them everywhere. You know, and they all date to the time of construction of Quebec with Tepe, you know, let's say um, eight to nine thousand BC, roughly. Um, And you can just, you know, they're just there. I mean, you know, obviously you're not supposed to pick them up, but you can't help but, you know, pick them up occasionally. Mm -hmm. And it's not there at Ganun Padang. And and that's something that I've said to Danny Hillman, you have to sort out. I wrote to him, you know, since I've been back saying, 
you know, you, you need a field expedition in the area to try and find evidence of a material culture. I mean, they found a couple of, of strange artifacts there, which, you know, uh, which are odd and very peculiar, but don't really fit any particular culture. But very close by to Kanumpadang, just in the next river basin, which is the, the, the Bangdung Basin, um, there is a very, very ancient material culture that used obsidian. Really? Um, to create these these flint tools, oh, sorry, flints, these stone tools, and these are found on the slopes all around what used to be a big lake um, within the centre of the of the Bangdun River Basin, um, and that this lake started to disappear as early as sixteen thousand BC. I mean, all right, there were small parts of it that continued on until around two thousand BC, but the importance here is that this this Bangdun obsidian culture was up and running and very extensive and not far from from uh, Gunungpadang, perhaps 16,000 years ago. And there are also legends that link this weaver princess who I've been talking about mm -hmm. with the creation of the Bangdun Lake, which suggests that these tales... These stories actually go back as much as 16 to 16,000 BC. And if that's correct, you obviously have a, a very developed culture existing around this lake long before it disappeared. Um, and whoever this culture is, they cannot be unconnected with those that constructed Ganumpadang. You know, it would be silly to suggest there was not a link. And this, I think, is the way forward. We now, we have to try and understand who created Ganumpadang and who this culture were and where they came from. And, and that's what I shall be trying to do, you know, in my next book. Oh, fascinating, Andrew. I'm hooked already, brother. I'm hooked already. Uh, super exciting. I can't believe the obsidian connection again, as most of uh... Well, I mean, as soon as I saw obsidian, I, 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 my eyes lit up because... <laughs> I bet, Andrew, I bet. All, Just for all the, the benefit... way around the world... Yeah, a benefit for the audience. the obsidian trial because obsidian is a high status substance which is is generally controlled by an elite group mm -hmm. so if you follow the the obsidian trail that will lead you to you know elites um and you know the hearts of of you know of high culture um and i i think that you'll find this all over the world obsidian is so valuable so important that it's the key to a, an awful lot of things about understanding the ancient mindset. Yeah, oh, for sure. Yeah, I know from our last conversation uh, for the TV interview, Andrew, uh, I was just fascinated with the, what you told me about the Gebekli Tepe uh, uh, location um, and the Yusidian found uh, in, in that locale. Um, Absolutely. But in, yeah, it's incredible stuff, Andrew. Incredible. Uh, great to see you out there doing the research too, Andrew. Uh, you know, a lot of respect for you as a as a researcher because you go out in the field and you, and you look for this stuff uh, and as well as doing the, the the academic and the book research too. Uh, prolific, Andrew. Um, well, we, come I mean, if, if you're going to write about these things, you've got to go to these sites. That's sure. the thing. You cannot be armchair researchers. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you, I mean, that and Hugh and myself and obviously Brian, you know, we go to these places. I mean, yes, we, you know, we, we try and get there through organizing tours and things like that because, you know, we haven't, we, we, you know, we haven't got limitless money. You know, we need to be able to get to that part of the world to do our research. And that's why these tours are so important that the likes of Brian and myself and Hugh put together, whether they be to Gebekli Tepe, to Peru and Bolivia, which is coming up in June and July, you know, or Egypt or Baalbek, um, or Southeast Asia, which is, you know, where Hugh and I have just been to Cambodia. Um, and then we stepped from Cambodia across into Java to see Ganung Padang. You know, when we do these tours, that's why we do them. We, you know, we encourage people to come with us to these sites. <coughs> and a part of this, is obviously that we can do the research as well. Sure. Of course, there's, it's the June tour for <coughs> Peru. That's coming up pretty fast. Uh, and we have May and September for Gebekli Tepe. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. People can still come out with us in May to Gebekli Tepe. It's so, totally safe out there. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of people that contact and say, Oh, is it safe? You know, with all the problems in Syria, 
life goes on as normal in Turkey and yeah. has done, obviously, since the troubles began. And there will not be any troubles in eastern Turkey. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, people need to understand that. We can try and give them, you know, this, you know, th this peace of mind to allow them to come out there because, you know, everything going on as normal. Um, and you'll see these incredible sights. You know, if you if, if you are afraid of just a few things that, that are going on in another country, you'll never see anything. Sure. Sure. I'm going to link up those tours on CapricornRadio.com and I'll stick them into the YouTube description when people are listening there as well. Uh, you'll get that on the members page as well. But uh, exciting tours, guys. I'd love to see you guys together doing this. It's like a it's like a megalithic think tank, Andrew, to see you guys all together. Um, uh, moving on to Brian. Brian, uh, let, let's come back to Peru and Bolivia. Uh, what's happening with the new pyramid that's been discovered in Tiwanaku, Brian? Well, <laughs> I'm actually, I'm not sure about that. Um, is, is it a pyramid? Is, is it structure or anomaly? Well, I haven't seen any convincing photographs, and that's why it's important that Andrew and Hugh and I go there in June. Yeah. Um, I'm actually going to be there in May as well, so I'll be able to report firsthand. There are so many claims made about, um, you know, about some of these ancient places from people who actually haven't been there. So what, what's very important is that, you know, is that we physically go and report on, on what we see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do we know, though, Brian? What, what, let's start with what we do know. It's, a, it's an anomaly that's been picked up with uh, radar. Is that right? It, it could be. I honestly haven't paid much attention to it because there are so many claims that, you know, that go on through the Internet about things being discovered. We do know that there are a, that there are a number of structures most likely underneath the Tiwanaku complex that haven't been excavated. Yeah, yeah. Um, of course, you've talked about it as a cataclysmic uh, flood or some sort of a, a soil has covered a lot of uh, stuff there, Brian, before. Yeah, it has. The whole site has been buried in uh, very fine red mud, um, high in iron oxide, which is typical of the area. And there was an ancient cataclysm of some kind that either came from Lake Titicaca or from uh, another lake that no longer exists that swept over the site and buried Tiwanaku and Pumapunku in the distant past. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, Brian, what's happened? Uh, I know you do uh, not just the megalithic research too. Uh, what's happening with respect to DNA analysis and, and, and schools and stuff like that? Well, it's been a very long process, as everyone knows. It's taken more than three years. But at this point, we have a, a very senior Peruvian archaeologist who is an expert on the Paracas Nazca culture, who is leading a study. Um, he is about, to, or he is preparing his proposal to the Peruvian government in order to be able to take samples from five skulls from the Paracas History Museum and send those samples, as well as hair samples, um, to a laboratory in North America that is, is ready and waiting to, uh, to do analysis of them. Um, and as well, hair samples will be sent to one of the world authorities on ancient hair in the United States to study whether the red hair of the Paracas is in fact genetically red mm -hmm. or uh, some type of dye. Um, and so we are probably weeks away from being able to take the samples and send them off to the lab in North America for quite quite rapid, we think, analysis. Wow, fascinating, Brian. I had Aaron Judkins on the show yesterday uh, telling me about his adventures in Peru, and uh, um, it, I just think it's so fascinating with the red here. It, it just talks genetics, and when you talk genetics, it's almost like these, uh, you can't, it's hard to think anything but hybrid or another race or another civilization or another group of people, if you want to call it that, um, th these these people stand out the skulls, the the hair. Um, it, it's hard to think anything else, Brian. Well, the amazing, you know, the amazing thing is I just, or it's not that amazing that I did, but I just finished writing um, volume two about the elongated skulls, focusing on Peru and Bolivia, in terms of uh, where these ancient people were located who did cranial deformation. I've uh, been able to form. Uh, quite a specific uh, geographic pattern and uh, related time frame. And the most intriguing thing about the Paracas culture, which is the main focus, is that even 
uh, the archaeologists um, in Peru and elsewhere understand that um, prior to the Paracas culture existing on the coast of Peru, there were possibly some nomadic people living in the area, but, but all of a sudden, 800 BC, you have this fully blown culture existing there and living there with, the, with these elongated skulls and red hair up until about 100 AD, and then suddenly you have their collapse. And I think what happened was, I think the Nazca culture, which um, moved in and took over the area, were responsible for the termination of the Paracas elite members who had the elongated skulls. Oh, incredible, Brian, incredible. Um, of course, you've got that tour coming up uh, in June, Brian. Please take a moment, give us out your website and where people can catch the tour there as well, Brian. Sure. My uh, my website is hiddenincatours.com. Um, and that's all linked up for the tour there as well, yeah? Exactly. I just updated the, the front page today, and it has uh, a listing... It's, it's mainly focusing on our June, June tour. It has links to Hugh's website, Andrew's website, and uh, just emphasizing that um, this will be the first time that Hugh and Andrew and I have been together um, in South America, and it gives uh, all three of us a chance to, sh to share with our guests um, not only the elongated skull phenomenon, but also the intriguing megalithic sites of Peru and Bolivia. Sure. You think there's a lot of commonalities at uh, Gebekli Tepe and Peru from the photographs, the footage? Well, that's what that's something we're going to uh, discuss in the field, and that's why it's it's great that both Hugh and Andrew will be able to share their you know most recent findings with us as we travel through the landscape of Peru and Bolivia. Wow, sounds exciting, guys. I've been Peru. I, I, I left my heart there. It's such a magical place, Peru. There's just something about Peru. I love the people as well, and I, and I love the culture. I love the climate. I love everything. I love the food. I love the, I love the ancient monuments, of course. And uh, um, How long is the tour, Brian? What, 10 days? Is that right? Uh, well, the main tour is July, uh, sorry, June 19th to 29th. And there's an extension before that, which is the Nazca Paracas area, including ah. flying over the lines. Excellent. And then after that is Bolivia, uh, where we explore places such as Tiwanaku and Puma Punku. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just came back from uh, Switzerland with Eric von Daniken. and I've been looking at his uh, photographs of Nazca. It's absolutely mind blowing. I actually wasn't aware just how many individual uh uh, glyphs, uh, animal figurines and lines there was because what we see on television is like a sanitized version, Brian. We don't seem to see all the, the, the great scope of this place. No, that's true. They, In general, most documentaries focus on maybe six of the geoglyphs, of course, the spider, the monkey, the hummingbird. Mm -hmm. But what's, what's more important on this trip is that uh, people will have the opportunity, if they want to, to take an extended flight, and that takes them over what are called the Palpa geoglyphs, and there are more than a thousand of them on the tops of mountains, including various things that look like runways, uh, 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 geometric shapes, um, some animal figures. So the entire landscape that we call the Nazca geoglyphs actually goes all the way from Paracas on the coast of Peru in a north or sorry, southeasterly direction down and into Nazca. So you're talking hundreds of square miles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, fascinating, Brian. I really look forward to hearing some feedback on that as well uh, in, in due course. Uh, you, wow, uh, I know we've got megalithomania coming up as well. Uh, take a moment for that, Brian, uh, you. Uh, tell me what's, who's coming to megalithomania. Uh, what are you going to be presenting there, you? Gunnang Padang, per, per, perhaps. Uh, well, I'm sure Gunnang Padang will certainly get a mention. That, that, that I think it's inevitable um, because um, I wasn't intending to talk about it, but inevitably that will come in because such a remarkable place um yeah the conference obviously is um we do it every may it's on the 9th of may this year it's the one day one with some tours and other things around it mm -hmm. uh we've got patrick McManaway, who's like a master dowser geomancer who's been doing some amazing tests with seed technologies um using you know megalithic science to kind of develop that uh, Richard Heath, who's the brother of Robin Heath, is going to be there talking about sacred number. Oh yes, uh, and he's very much in. You know, he's very much uh, in with John Michel, and it's going to be actually his mem annual memorial lecture we do it at the conference. Jim Vieira's coming over from America, 
share his research with giants, New England sites. Uh, Chris H. Hardy, who's done the book The Sacred Network and DNA of the Gods. Myself, obviously, uh, and Peter Knight, oh, who's, cool. um, who's looking at the comparisons between Christianity and uh, megalithic sites. And, uh, yeah, we do this every year. Uh, obviously, we do a conference. Me and Andrew do one in the autumn, in October or November this year, uh, every year, in fact, so far, um, hopefully around November the 7th or 8th. That's going to be with Graham Hancock and Andrew, myself, and some other very special guests. Uh, that's in London. That's the Origins so, Conference. That's the Origins Conference, yeah. We do, we do keep fairly busy. Um, but uh, And then uh, after after Megalithomania, obviously, there's the Gobekli Tepe mini tour Andrew and I are doing. And then in June, we pop over to Peru and Bolivia and do all that. So quite a lot going on this year, actually. Wow. But um, uh, the time is now, really. You know, we have to kind of get out to these places and explore and, um, you know, and uh, explore as much as we can. Oh, great. I've had Chris Hardy on the show, actually, before. Uh, and uh, uh, Richard Heath, uh, I actually have his book. I've read the book, Lords of Time, there. A uh, fascinating book. I've been looking forward to meeting uh, Richard here as well. Um, of course, I'm going to Megalithomania, my first Megalithomania conference year. I'm really excited about it. So Excellent. Look, Excellent. Looking forward to catching up with you there as well for some TV stuff as well. But uh, um, what's happening in the world of giants and research? Uh, I know that was a great uh, first season you did with uh, Jim Vieira and the Vieira brothers. Um, uh, what's happening with the giants research? Do, is there anything happening uh, in terms of uh, press uh, in America? Well, there, there's there's a huge amount going on. What's happening is what's what's really interesting is that more newspaper archives are being mm. uh, let out onto the internet. And so what's happening is more and more being discovered. It's, it's becoming this kind of insane kind of catch-up, trying to keep up to date with all the ones that are being discovered. And there's a whole bunch of budding giantologists on the case now who are, like, looking through all the papers for us. We've got some researchers who work with us, a guy called Mikey Ewers is based in uh, California. Mm-hmm. Andrew and his colleague Greg Little are doing some excellent research, which they um, outlined as part of Souls. And there's some other stuff. We're actually meeting up with um, Andrew and Greg, me and Jim are in a couple of weeks in America to look at some sites uh, and to um, sort of put our heads together about a few ideas. So that should be quite. We'll have to you know, give you the feedback on that after it's happened, of course. But there's um, Jim and I are almost finished our book. We're just working on the last parts of the book. Um, we, we're hoping to get it out for Megalithomania, but it's unlikely to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. But it'll be out soon after. Um, but there's such a vast amount of, of research and data and, you know, it's just finding the bones, the teeth, the skulls. That's what we want. And this is what's, um, this is what the TV shows really help with. It's put us in contact with a whole bunch of people who watch the show on History Channel and they've actually contacted us and said, look, we've got stuff we can show you. So we're, um, we're going to follow some of that up over the next few months. Uh, mm. towards the end of the year as well and uh, see if any revelations come out about that. But the fact that you've got the Smithsonian actually digging up very large skeletons, you know, I think 17 accounts of that, um, you, you have to kind of realise it's a very real thing. It's not just made up, which a lot of the sceptics are trying to uh, say nowadays. Uh, there's some particular ones, I won't mention the names, um, but they're trying to discredit the whole phenomenon where if you look at just the basic facts, it's an incredibly difficult one to uh, deny. Even you know, you know, because you get tall people nowadays. You get people with two rows of teeth nowadays. It's not, it's not that unusual. But um, back then in North America, um, there seemed to be a whole race of these giants who were pretty phenomenal beings. Mm-hmm. Wow! I actually caught a documentary. Uh... Where there was a, it was about Sardinia and uh, the legend of giants there and the megaliths and uh, the, the guy had a tooth and uh, again there was a cover up uh, the tooth went missing as soon as it goes into the museum <laughs> stuff's never seen again oops we lost it type of thing you know yeah. it's, it seems to be the operating system stuff gets lost I've never known so many I think putting stuff in a museum sometimes is the worst place you can get in. <laughs> Well, the, the problem with, with North America is there's, there's, there's a couple of different things. First of all, you've got the Smithsonian involved, and there seems to be a lot of uh, disappearing skeletons and skulls with them. Uh, there's debate as to it, whether it's a conspiracy or whether it's just ignorance, but there's so many accounts, even the ones they've kind of dug up themselves, mm-hmm. and they're still in denial about it. I, I 
to the present day. And then in 1990, the NAGPRA Act, the Native American uh, Graves uh, uh, Repatriation Act, I think I've got that slightly wrong, uh, came in. And that was a collusion between the Native Americans and the government to remove all Native American remains from public display. So hence, every single giant skeleton or skull or tooth or anything that was on display, boom, it gets reburied. So it's gone. So there, so you've got the Smithsonian problem you're dealing with, mm. and you've got NAGPRA you're dealing with. And it's actually illegal to even, you know, actually show anything in a, in a, in a book or uh, on TV or anything like that, show any of these remains. So even though there's a debate about these giants, whether they were ancestors of the Native Americans, whether there was some other uh, diffusionism going on in prehistory, you have a lot of red-haired giants in the, in the West and some in, and some in the East, Going back eight or nine thousand years, um, it's a real it's a real tricky subject, and all, all we can do is uh, you know uh, share the accounts publicly mm-hmm. uh, in, in book format on TV or whatever we can do, um, and hopefully you know the truth will emerge naturally. Wow, wow, y- yeah, you know it's it's it sounds clandestine and surreptitious to me, Brian. It stinks of it, but that's just my own personal opinion. That this whole stuff disappearing in museums and uh it, like i say i mean who would want that evidence out there i mean you know if it's if there was another group uh acting in in history i mean the archaeologists it would just shake the foundations of all archaeology it really would um you know it's i think the best thing that they, they want they would do would put it in a box and label it and unhide it you know? well, yeah, I agree. I mean, but it's it's like anything that's suppressed or covered up. It's, it makes you want to investigate it, doesn't it? So I think this is one of those classic ones. It's like Brian's research on the skulls mm. down in Peru and Bolivia. It's it's the same with these giants in North America. I mean, it, it's 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 a sort of crazily kind of intriguing subject. It seems to have all. It's almost like a spell that was put over it, stop mm. people researching it and talking about it, and mm-hmm. that spell's been broken. And now everyone's going right, okay. Let's get into this. Let's 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 sort of challenge uh, uh, what's going on here and see if we can expose it. Because to me, you know, it's a real. It's like with the megalithic sites or, or anything. It's like it, it, this is these are our ancestors. These are our relations going back, you know, hundreds or thousands of years. So it's actually our heritage, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. our legacy. So we, we need to kind of honor that a little bit, and rather than try and suppress it and let or let people suppress it and cover it up. Actually, you know, it's a human right, in my opinion, and we, we need to kind of expose it and uh, get it out into the mainstream the best we can. Very well said, Brian. Very well, our uh, Hugh. Sorry, very well articulated. Uh, it's, it is our heritage. It's our it's our human. It's our own human journey, and uh, uh, whatever branch of human we're talking about, it's our own story, our own legacy. And uh, you know, we're we're living in a time of history and research now. That's just cutting edge it's 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 cutting edge history all the way now i never seen history so much alive hugh please give us a moment to, to give us at your website we can catch the the tours that we've been talking about plus the conference yeah for sure yeah it's, it's just www.megalithomania.co.uk so it's megalithomania.co.uk uh, everything's on there it's also you can go to hughnewman.co.uk and that just takes you to my page on the megalithomania site and uh and just, you know, Google Megalithomania or Hugh Newman and you'll, you'll find everything, you know, we're up to. Excellent. And uh, great information on the whole tour there and who's who and the bios on yourselves. Uh, um, great to see all that there, Brian, or Hugh, um, Brian and Andrew together. Um, really, really exciting. I'm looking forward to updates on that as well. Um, I just finish up with you, Andrew, I guess. Um, uh, what's new for you with uh, the Denosovans, the hybrids, <coughs> uh, that type of research? Well, um, this is another area that's opening up uh, so much now because of the DNA research that's being done on early human remains Mm -hmm. by the Max Planck Institute um, in uh, Leipzig in Germany. Um, And basically what they've been doing is uh, testing the, the nuclear DNA and the mitochondrial DNA of, you know, Neanderthals, the Denisovans, um, and any other, uh, you know, really early fossil remains going back at the moment to around 400, 450,000 years ago. And what this doing is giving us a, a much clearer picture of, you know, not only these different archaic humans as they're known, but 
how they mixed with each other um, and how they quite clearly interbred to create hybrids, whether that be Neanderthal human hybrids, Denisovan human hybrids, um, or there has, has actually been a toe bone found in the Altay Mountains, um, which they've examined, and it has the DNA of four different types. That's Homo sapiens, Neanderthals, Denisovans, and a archaic human that they don't even know what it is because mm. they can't match it against anything. Incredible. Um, it's it could be a Homo erectus. That's the best option at the moment. And Homo erectus is one of the earliest forms of human that supposedly died out, you know, maybe about half a million years ago. But it is known that a form of Homo erectus continued on in Java down to about 25,000 BC. Um, and that um, there's evidence that, that they continued to exist uh, in Java, possibly even in parts of China. I mean, recently, a huge great jawbone was found dredged up by fishermen off the coast of Taiwan. Um, and it's so strange that, uh, you know, they, they, they don't really know, you know, what type of, of human it's come from. And again, the best guess is that it's Homo erectus. But if it is, it's very late, possibly as late as fifteen to 20,000 years ago. So, you know, that there's all of this, all of this, this melting pot of activity. And we need to understand how any of this might have affected the rise of civilization. Because it's okay being a Neanderthal, you know, we're told that they are, you know, that they were sluggish, they were brutes, they were this and the other. But we now know that's not true. We now know that they, that they painted caves, they wore, they adorned themselves in feather coats, um, you know, they, they used musical instruments, um, and almost certainly they had some kind of religion involving the burial of their dead. They could speak probably little different to, to, to you and I, something that again is only very recently been confirmed. And they had their own different mindset, that, a, a mindset that was quite different to Homo sapiens. You know, I think in the early days we were probably survivalists. You know, we were territorial. We'd, we'd go in, bash the people on the head and take over their lands and then just move on and, and, you know, and do this. Whereas Neanderthals have been around for hundreds of thousands of years, developing their, 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 their culture, their way of life. And it seems as if they had a, a strong attraction to the moon, um, and to the idea of women's cycles, um, and its relationship to the moon. Um, and may have developed this into some kind of religion. Well, the fact is that when Neanderthals came together with humans, it created almost like a new type of human being, something that had completely different mindsets. One, the dreamy, you know, sort of otherworldly mindset of the Neanderthal, but also the survivalist, rationalist side of the Homo sapien. And it seems as if huge advances actually occurred once this hybridization took place. Now, we Homo sapiens, um, you know, um, uh, interbred with with the the Neanderthals in the West, but in the East, in in Eastern Asia, it was the Denisovans, and we know that the Denisovans, as much as forty fifty thousand years ago, from evidence coming from this Denisova cave in the Altai Mountains were producing incredibly high, you know, items of high culture, including these um, bracelets in uh, in this green stone uh, known as clitorite light, which looked like something that might have been produced just a couple of thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're just extraordinary. And more than this, um, the the teeth that were found in connection with the Denisovans are of large size, and there are various accounts that suggest that when they were first found, it was thought that they belonged to a cave bear or something because they were so large. Um, and there is other DNA evidence that suggests that the Denisovans um, were, in fact, of extremely, uh, uh, extremely tall in nature. They may well have been giants. Um, and that the admixture of them and Homo sapiens could well have created the giants which roamed the land 
uh, particularly in North America, but almost certainly in South America and, of course, in other parts of the world, and that these giants may well have been Denisovan human hybrids. Um, this is a very exciting prospect. It's something that I wrote about with Greg Little uh, in the book Path of Souls last year, and I shall certainly be writing a lot more about uh, in a new book which has a working title of Hybrid Origins, which I'm you know, which will feature Ganumpa Dang, the mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and much more of what we've been talking about today. Um, so, you know, this is the area that, that I'm looking into now, because it does seem as if when hybrids are created, civilization follows very quickly. Sure. Uh, do we have like migratory routes from Denosova Cave, uh, obviously probably heading southwards down in towards Turkey? Um, well, that would obviously be the Western migration. Yeah. And yes, there is. Um, and it goes basically from the, the Altai Mountains through the Ural Mountains into central Russia, where as early as 30,000 to 40,000 years ago, there were incredibly advanced communities um, that had uh, astronomically aligned longhouses made of, of wood and um, a mammoth bone, mm. um, we, they had agriculture, they had a, a, a fully developed mother goddess cult, you know, with these beautiful um, Venus-like statues. Um, they had tailored clothing. They had communities which wouldn't be out of place in medieval times. Um, and these people were known as the Gravatians. And, and their main centers were in central Russia um, and also in the country that we now know today as the Republic of, um, of well, the Czech Republic, Czechoslovakia, former Czechoslovakia. These are their two big focal areas. And what's clear is that the, the heart of these are Neanderthal human hybrids. Uh, and the descendants of these peoples went on to be known as the, the Swiderians. And the Swiderians, whose, whose uh, culture stretched from the Carpathian Mountains in the west right the way across to the, um, the big rivers of, of Russia, like the Volga and the Don River, um, almost certainly their descendants were the ones that came south at the end of the, the last ice age and entered into Anatolia and I think became the power elite behind the construction of Gebekli Tepe. Mm -hmm. that, that seems to be a, a, a pretty you know, sensible solution to what was going on um, in Gebekli Tepe. So there is a link mm. between Gebekli Tepe via Russia to the Altai Mountains and there from there eastwards through Siberia, places like Lake Bacow, um, across into North America and southeastwards into places like Java, you know, where we have Ganunta Padang. So th th there is actually a link behind all of these cultures. And I think that one of the keys to understanding the lost civilization, if you like, is hybridization. Sure. That is, I think, the key. And, that, and that's why I'm looking into it so strongly now. Wow, oh, fascinating. And, of course, we can catch all this at andrewcollins.com. Uh, of course, you'll get the Origins Conference there. I'm really excited about that, Andrew, to see that on again. Uh, yourself and you there, and Graham as well, making an appearance. Uh, yes, great. yeah. I mean, it's not absolutely finalised yet. Hugh and I are working on it as we speak, um, uh, you know, to try and finalise it. So uh, just watch this space as far on all of our websites regarding uh, how we go there. Okay, so I'm going to link all the sites on the YouTube description and the Capricorn Thank Radio you. and members page, uh, CapricornRadio.com. Guys, absolutely fascinating talking to all of you guys. Uh, wow, what a megalithic roundtable that was. Such exciting news as well and uh, such exciting research going on. I really thank you for all your time today, guys. No, it's our pleasure. Absolutely. Yeah, it's great talking to you, James and crew. Good.